church. Um, it's a beautiful day out. I was really, really loving it um, this morning when I got up. And I went outside and, you yeah, know, okay, it was 25 degrees, but still, it was the sun was up, right? So I can't complain. <laughs> So we want to welcome any guests or visitors that we have with us today and invite you all to stay after and join us in a time of fellowship um, where we can get to know you a little bit better. And we want to welcome Becky, who's covering from Maryland today. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you here with us, Becky. Thank you. So you see the announcements in the bulletin. Um, the Friday morning Bible study is continuing at 10 a.m., and that's led by Maisie, and that'll be in the pastor's study. And last week, we decided to go ahead and continue. Um, we had set up the Tuesday Bible study strictly as a Lenten uh, study, and we've decided to go ahead and continue that past Easter. So that will become a regular um, event in our weekly calendar. Uh, we'll keep doing that at uh, 5 p.m. on Tuesdays, and that'll be in the Fellowship Hall, and I will lead that one. Uh, PW meets on Friday the 8th at 2, and that'll be in the Fellowship Hall. Um, we have, we're doing a pickup choir for Easter, which is really kind of exciting. And so we have a couple of rehearsal dates, um, as noted in the bulletin, and that'll be here in the sanctuary. And then the session meets on the 14th at 5 p.m. in the pastor study. And if you have not signed up for the Easter potluck dinner, um, the sign-up sheet is in the hall. And I would encourage you all to sign up. Do we have any other announcements? Okay. Let's take a moment of silence to center ourselves as we prepare to worship Almighty God. Amen. God has formed us as God's own. We give thanks and praise to the one who always welcomes us home. And I'll invite Julie Hook to come forward at this time for our Lenten reading. This is the fifth Sunday in Lent. When we arrived this morning, we entered into the normal bustle of a church on a Sunday morning. Friends greeting each other, choir members getting their robes, children bringing their energy and enthusiasm. Now that we are sitting together in the pews, I invite you to close your eyes and consider the word sanctuary. A sanctuary is a place set aside for sacred things. It is a place of refuge and protection. This room is a sanctuary. The season of Lent is a kind of sanctuary, extended in time. And one of the things Lent teaches us that you, too, are a sanctuary. There is inside you a place for sacred things, a place where God abides. As we extinguish this light, we acknowledge the darkness and pain of war and oppression in the world. Let us pray. Loving God, we open our hearts to you. We invite you into our inmost being, only to find you already there. Strengthen us in our quiet places, and then lead us into the work of justice and peace. Amen. Thank you, Julie. And I invite you to join in hymn number 399, God Welcomes All. I'm going to ask that, uh, that Becky play it through once, and then we will sing it twice. This is a call to worship. <clears throat> when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those in a dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and shouts of joy. We rejoice. The Lord has done great things for us. May those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, come home with joy, carrying their sheep. 
And please stand and join us in hymn 314, Christ Be Our Light. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Purifying God, we grow comfortable with the way things are in our lives, in the church, and in the world. We do not always welcome the new life you offer in Christ. For you overturn our notions of power and protocol. Sure of our own righteousness, we are critical of others. Wanting to control our assets, we hold the gifts you give us. Forgive us, we pray, for seeking our gain at the expense of others. Help us bend our life towards your own life of self-giving and sacrifice. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Siblings in Christ, hear this good news. In Christ, we are forgiven. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. Thanks be to God. And as we have reconciled with God through Christ Jesus, let us reconcile with one another through a sharing of Christ's peace, saying, the peace of Christ be with you and responding, and also with you. Please share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. Peace be with you. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without it. Amen. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 And amen. You may be seated. We come now to the time in our service where we share our joys, our concerns, our prayer requests with each other so that we as a community of faith may pray for and with you. And I'll start out by asking prayers for all of our travelers. We have quite a number of folks who are out today uh, for various reasons. Um, so we ask prayers, our traveling mercies for all of our, all of our uh, members and friends who are not with us today, who are having to be out there traveling. I also want to continue lifting up prayers for the situation, the war in Ukraine. Um, there have been some changes in the situation this last week, but it still is um, a very bad situation for the Ukrainians and also for the Russians. So we want to continue to lift up prayers for that situation, for the war, and we would and lift up prayers for peace. So, are there other joys or concerns that you would like to share at this time? Maisie. My daughter Catherine has worshiped in the Scottish church. And I would just like to, ask, to pray that she would have a good day and that the church would be blessed. Do you know which church by any chance? Do you know which church she's worshiping in, Maisie? I don't. Okay. Because, of course, St. Giles Cathedral is there in Edinburgh, and that's, the, and that's the mother church of all of us Presbyterians all over the world. We will pray. Are there other joys or concerns? Okay. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy and gracious God, on this beautiful day, we are so grateful for the opportunity to worship, to stand on this holy ground and worship you. We're glad for the connections that 
mean that there are Christians all over the world today who are worshiping you in houses built with loving hands meant to be sanctuaries, places of safety, places of learning, places of shelter. And Holy God, we know that those sanctuaries are few and far between in the country of Ukraine right now. And we especially ask your blessings on the people of Ukraine as we enter the seventh week of an unprovoked war. And we pray these things saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, we continue to lift up Sue Smith, Jay Hook and his family, Jay Lish, and Alicia Price. You know why these folks are on our prayer list, God. And together we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we continue to lift up Ben Gibby, Lori, Haley Curtis, Billy Joe Skinner, Jonah and Mary Gear. And we pray saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up Gene Poltz and his entire family. Kara Lee, Dee Blandendike, Sarah Lau, Ross and Linda Walker, and Jim and Josette Huntsinger. And we pray these things saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we lift up Rossi, Dora Lee Maisie, Dixie Ledbetter, Dustin Holston, McKay Hansen, Pastor Joy, Kathy Hogan, and Damian Henderson. And God, we pray these things saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up the Belize mission. Victims of violence and disaster, our country and its leaders. And we pray again for peace in our homes, in our communities, and in the world. And we pray these things saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God, we know that there are times when there are prayer requests that we carry so deeply within our hearts that we are unable to speak them aloud. And so, Holy One, we take a moment of silence to lift those prayer concerns to you as well. And all of these prayers, God, we lift up in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand and join in hymn number 462, I Love to Tell the Story. The first scripture reading we're doing today is Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through 21. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior, they lie down. They cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things, or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, 
rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they may, might declare my praise. The second reading is Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Nijeb. May those who sow tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. May the good Lord put the, uh, his blessing upon these readings. Our third reading today comes from John, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal from what was put in it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Sisters and brothers, all three of these readings are God's word for God's people. And we respond by saying, thanks be to God. So, we had a very interesting discussion about this passage at the Tuesday night Bible study. And the first question that came up, right out of the box, was about Mary. Was Mary of Bethany actually Mary Magdalene? It's a valid question, given that in Luke's account of this story, the woman remains unnamed. There are some other differences between Luke's account and John's account. For in Luke we read that Jesus was having dinner with Simon the Pharisee, while John writes about the dinner taking place in the home of Jesus' really good friends. The biggest difference, however, is the description of the woman in these stories. Luke says that she was a woman who led a sinful life. John tells of a woman who was a close friend of Jesus and his disciples, and John makes no mention of sin. Another difference revolves around the status of Judas Iscariot. Luke doesn't mention him at all, while Judas becomes a central character in John's version of this text. Now, it's hard to know which version of the story is closest to what really happened, and there's a lot to be gleaned from both versions. That said, if I have to pick the one I think is closer to the truth, I'd have to go with how John tells this story. So, here we see Jesus returning to Bethany, to the home of his closest friends outside of the twelve disciples, 
It's likely that he came here often when he just needed a break and wanted to get away from the pressures of ministry. Jesus and the disciples were on their last leg of the long journey to Jerusalem. And I imagine that Jesus wanted one last visit with those who were like family to him before he faced what he knew was coming. At this point in our timeline, however, it's probably the first time Jesus has come back since he raised Lazarus from the dead. And that event, by the way, is what caused the powers to be to initiate the plot to kill Jesus. And with this visit, that plan has almost come to fruition. Now, I think it's really interesting that John includes both Mary and Judas in this account. And I'll note that the other versions of the story, none of the other gospel writers explicitly name the disciples who accompany Jesus. The assumption being that all 12 of the disciples were present. I believe John had a specific reason for mentioning Judas by name, and we'll get to that in a moment. So, like many of us who welcome friends we haven't seen in a while, the three siblings decide to throw a dinner party. They brought out the good china, the fancy tablecloths, and the best wine they could get their hands on. Good food, good drink, and good company. Who doesn't like a party? While all of this is going on, Mary does something absolutely shocking. She takes an entire pound of perfume and pours it on Jesus' feet and then wipes it up with her hair. Now I can imagine the disciples were appalled and Mary and Lazarus were probably extremely embarrassed. Because you see that this type of an intimate act would have violated every single custom and norm of the day. And it would normally have brought the celebrations to a screeching halt. It would not have been customary for an unmarried woman to unbind her hair in the presence of men. And it would not have been customary for a woman to have any physical contact with a man she wasn't married to or somehow related to. Everyone in the room would have been acutely aware of these rules, and they would have all taken great pains to abide by them. Such behavior should have provoked a very sharp rebuke from Jesus, as well as the disciples who were witnessing this. While we don't have a record of how the other disciples responded, John does tell us what, Je what Judas says about this. Why wasn't this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? Now, the writer of John's Gospel takes great pains to tell us that G Judas did not give a rat's behind about the poor. Yet, the question is a good one. The amount of money spent on the perfume was equivalent to approximately a year's wages for the average worker, and that's a lot of money any way you look at it. On the surface, selling the perfume and giving the money to help the poor was right in line with what Jesus had been teaching all along. And while Judas's words line up with what Jesus taught, it's what motivated Judas to speak out that becomes an issue. John makes it very clear that all Judas was interested in was getting more money put into the common purse so he could steal it. Now there's some speculation that Mary's act was her way of showing gratitude for Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And there's some validity to that claim. However, I believe that she did what she did because she really understood what was about to happen. She truly understood, perhaps better than anyone else in the room, who Jesus was and the sacrifice he was about to make. Remember, this is the same Mary who Jesus allowed to sit at his feet 
learning and absorbing everything she could about what he was teaching, even when Martha objected. Because Mary truly got it, she had purchased perfume at great cost in order to anoint Jesus' body after his death, which would have been consistent with the burial customs of the day, where perfume was utilized to cover up the stench of death. Mary did know. She knew what was in store for Jesus, and she was prepared to act on her knowledge. I also believe that Mary was so overwhelmed with the knowledge of the sacrifice Jesus was about to make and the fact that this would be the last time she would see a person who had meant so much to her and her family that that sense of overwhelmed, of being overwhelmed is what caused her to act in such an unconventional manner. It's how Jesus responds to both the faithfulness of Mary and the unfaithfulness of Judas. That is the central point John's trying to make here. Jesus doesn't rebuke Mary for breaking, shattering really, the ancient customs and norms of society, as shocking as it surely must have appeared. He doesn't take her to task for the extravagance of the gift or tell her that instead of wasting all that valuable perfume on a single act, that she should have given the money to the poor. Nor does Jesus call Judas out in a way that would have been in line with what he knew about Judas' upcoming betrayal. And let's be clear. Of course, Jesus knew that Judas stole from the common purse. And of course, Jesus knew that it was going to be Judas who would be the one who would turn him over to endure a horrible death on the cross. And nobody would have blamed Jesus for getting angry at both Mary and Judas. But that's not how Jesus responded to either of them. Instead, he allows Mary to break with tradition and anoint him without any sort of rebuke. He does rebuke Judas, but in a very mild way. Leave her alone, Jesus said. That's it. That's the extent of the rebuke the betrayer receives, even though Judas deserved so much more. So where does that leave us? Last week I talked about being stingy with God's grace. In presenting the parable of the prodigal son from the servant's point of view, I noted that God represents the father who broke all the rules when it came to welcoming his child home. I also noted that the servants, represented by each and every one of us, must have been shocked and dismayed at the violation of those rules and the fact that the father simply didn't care about the customs and norms of the day. The point I was making last week and the point I'll make here again is that God's grace is extravagant, over the top, and available to everyone no matter what. It's that all-inclusive, extravagant grace, the grace that is available to each and every one of us, that is at the core of John's message here. It's easy to understand why Jesus extended grace to Mary. She was a faithful disciple who did everything in her power to honor and follow the teachings of the Christ. It's not so easy to understand why that same gift of grace was offered just as freely to an unfaithful disciple such as Judas. Yet that's where the story takes us. Like Mary the faithful disciple, I do everything I can to follow the teachings of Jesus. And I'll admit that like Judas, the unfaithful disciple, there are times when my words don't match the motivation behind them. 
And I suspect I'm not alone in that. But here's the thing. Regardless of the fact that we all at times act like Mary, and other times we all might act like Judas, it simply doesn't make any difference to God when it comes to sharing the gift of God's grace. So, you might be asking, if it doesn't make any difference, what's the motivation to act like Mary and not Judas? And that's a good question. And you're, and you're going to be just shocked, I'm sure, to hear that I have some ideas about that, right? <laughs> it comes down to how we react to the greatest gift of all. God sending his son to point us in the direction of a new life of freedom from the bondage of old ways of thinking. God sending his son to offer freedom from the bondage of an us versus them theology. And God sending his son to give us freedom from anything and everything that separates us from God's presence in our lives. For me, the awe and the wonder that I feel when I know that God's grace is available to somebody even like me is all the motivation I need to strive to act like Mary. So, sisters and brothers, if we stand in awe and wonder at the extravagance of God's gift of grace to us, do we simply hoard it for ourselves? Do we really believe that this overwhelmingly amazing gift is just for us, or for those who we think deserve it? Or do we, in profound gratitude, choose to offer that same gift of grace that God has so freely given us to all we come in contact with? It's really easy to offer that grace to those who look like us, or think like us, or who believe like us. It's much more difficult to extend that gift to those who may reject it and us. Knowing what we know of Judas, I doubt anyone would have been surprised if Jesus had chosen not to extend grace to someone who, in a few short days, would betray him. Yet that's exactly what Jesus does. And can we honestly do anything less? That all-inclusive, extravagant grace is a remarkable and amazing gift from our God. The choice we have today, right here and right now, is very simple. Do we hoard the gift of grace for ourselves and for those we love and or approve of? Or do we, like Jesus, extend grace even to those who might mean to do us harm? If all really means all, y'all, then perhaps we already know the answer to those questions. Amen. We come now to the time of our morning offering. If the ushers will please come forward.
gracious God, we are returning a portion of your generosity back to you for the use of the furtherance of your kingdom in this place and in our world. We ask your blessings on these gifts that they may be used to your glory. And all these things we pray in your son's name. Amen. Please remain standing and join us in our communion hymn, number 525. Oh, I'm sorry, that's not right. Is it right? Yes. 525, let us pray to God. In your bulletin, there should have been an insert uh, for the communion liturgy. Um, I think there should have been one for everybody. It's interesting, when I stand here every month as we do communion, I'm always thinking of new ways to offer the invitation. Especially the invitation because that's what opens the door to this banquet. And as I was thinking about it this morning, you know, I was realizing that all over the world today, in churches big and small, in cathedrals and thatched huts in Africa, in cathedrals in Europe and little brick churches in South America. People are doing exactly this. And not because they have to, but because we are invited here to celebrate God's grace. This is the ultimate expression of what God's grace is about. None of us are worthy of sitting here or standing here or of taking these elements. Yet, God offers them to us without exception. And that's kind of humbling when you think about it, you know? We have a saying here at Soda Springs that all means all, y'all. And it's something that I truly believe. It's something I truly believe that God's grace is for all, you all, including people like me. So I'll invite you to turn to the insert in your bulletin. Your parts are in bold. And let us 
celebrate God's grace together. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Eternal God, holy and mighty, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise and to worship you in every place where your glory abides. You laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They shall perish, but you shall endure. You are always the same, and your years will never end. You make us in your image and called us to be your people. But we turn from you, leaving sin and death to reign. Still you loved us and sought us. In Christ, your grace defeated death and opened the way to eternal life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the heavenly choirs and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. You sent your only begotten, in whom your fullness dwells, to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. Revealing your love, Jesus taught those who would hear him, healed those who believed in him, and received all who sought him, and lifted the burdens of their sin. We glorify you for your great power and love at work in Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us a new people by water and the Spirit. We give you thanks that the Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took bread. And after giving thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink, do it in remembrance of me. Remembering all of your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ is one again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Help us, O God, to love as Christ loved. Knowing our own weakness, may we stand with all who stumble, sharing in his suffering. May we remember all who suffer. Held in his love, may we embrace all whom the world denies. Rejoicing in his forgiveness, may we forgive all who sin against us. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when with the redeemed, 
of all the angels, we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, eternal God, now and forever. Amen. And as our Savior taught us, we are bold to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to try something a little different with communion today. Um, I grew up where we did not have any music during communion. So we're going to give that a shot today and kind of give Becky a break. Um, but also, it is meaningful, I think, because it gives us a chance to really focus on what this is all about. So we'll see if, if this continues in the next few months, but today we will be dis distributing the elements in silence. I invite you to take the bread as you receive it and hold the cup until all have been served so we may take the cup together. I'll take last.
for you. The cup of grace poured out for you. The cup of grace poured out for you. Sisters and brothers in Christ, this is the cup of grace poured out for you. Thanks be to God. Please stand and join in our closing hymn. You know, before you do that, let me pray a little bit for you. Sorry about that. There's supposed to be a prayer after communion, I forget sometimes. Holy and gracious God, thank you. You have spared us with your spiritual food. May it nourish our bodies and our minds as we go out into the world to share your grace with all we encounter. Amen. Now you may stand and join us in our closing hymn, number Inclusive grace is for everyone, no ifs, ands, or buts. Go out and share God's amazing gift of grace with all you come in contact with, today and always. And may God watch between me and thee, while we're absent one from another, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.